Welcome everyone to our webinar, webinar tonight. My name is Sierra Sunset Leffers and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Dysautonomia International. It's my esteemed honor and pleasure to host tonight's webinar. And I'm so excited because it's my first webinar to host as well as it's such an impactful and valuable topic for our community. So a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Your video and microphones are not enabled during any of our Zoom webinars. If you'd like to use a closed captioning feature, please refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the CC or live transcript option. Additionally, you can choose how you wish to view the closed captioning on your personal device. If you wish to turn this feature off, just click the option to hide subtitles in a small area next to the CC button. You can type questions for our guest speakers using the Zoom Q&A tool. Please keep your questions relevant to the topic being discussed in general in nature. As always, we are unable to address any personal medical advice questions. And also, please not do not share any confidential information in the questions, as the whole audience may actually see your name and question if it is answered. Finally, we'd like to remind you that our annual conference is scheduled for June 28th through the 30th. We hope you can consider attending in person or choose one of our virtual options. With those out of the way, we can move on to our main event. So we appreciate you joining us to learn more about how to find a federal job that fits your exact needs. Our guest speaker tonight is Sarah Rindfleiss. Sarah is focused on recruitment and outreach in the Inclusion and Diversity Department in the National Park Service. Sarah started with the National Park Service in May of 2023 on their first national recruitment team. She has also volunteered in entomology at the Natural History Museum of Utah and has served as the vice president of the Lepidopter Lepidoptera Society in Utah. Her love of the natural sciences has been applied to facilitate outreach, field trips, research, and participate in the North American Butterfly Association annual counts. She's been living with POTS since 2021 and is an advocate for disability accommodations, inclusivity, and hiring. Welcome, Sarah. And with that, I'll turn it on over to you. Okay, thank you, Sierra. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, my audio description is I am female with medium length brown hair and glasses. I'm sitting in a white uh, chair, adaptive workspace. My background is neutral. I'm here with Tammy Robles, human resources officer and Sarah Peterson, HR specialist staffing with the National Park Service. They will both be moderating the chat to help answer questions along the way. And we will also have a general Q&A as well. This Federal Careers Workshop has been designed with this group in mind, and you can use the information we will review for any federal opportunity posted on USA Jobs, the official uh, government application website. So Tammy and Sarah, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good evening, I'm Tammy Robles. I'm the Human Resource Officer with the National Park Service. I oversee the National Recruitment Team. And I'll, I'm excited to answer any questions that you have in the chat today. Thank you guys for being here, we appreciate you. I'll turn it over to Sarah. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Peterson and I am a Human Resources Specialist in Staffing and Placement with the National Park Service. And I'm thrilled to see so many interested applicants here tonight. Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. All right, uh, so we'll start off uh, with the mission of the National Park Service. The mission of the National Park Service is to preserve the unimpaired uh, natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the benefits of natural and cultural resource con conservation and outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. Um, Many national park sites are visited by uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors every year from all corners of the globe. Uh, NPS by the numbers. Um, so I know you can't read any, uh, every park and site. Uh, this will give you a general idea of where parks are located. There's managed sites in every park, uh, every territory and state with over 425 managed sites and uh, 27,000 full-time employees. So just to give you an idea, you can see here in the Northeast um, how many parks are clustered around cities, Washington, DC. And then as we move towards the West, parks tend to be more spread out and larger. Um, a good way to find NPS sites is through the NPS app on your phone. You can visit the Apple or Google Play Store and there may be some parks in your community that maybe you haven't thought of. Um, these are our highest demand careers on this page. Um, park ranger interpretation and protection, uh, maintenance workers, administration, park guides, and biological uh, science technician. There's 
a large range of varied roles, uh, working with fire, motor vehicles, concessions, emergency medical exhibits, and more. Um, so you can see here, there's some photos of our park public servants at work. We can see uh, fires up there practicing some drills. We can see an administrative support assistant working at a computer. And there's some maintenance uh, working on a bridge down below. Uh, here's our USA Jobs overview. We're going to work through three main areas, navigating USA Jobs, building your profile, a jobs announcement, uh, how to make your resume searchable, and using the template builder. Now, using the template builder is pretty important. Uh, so uh, that will ensure you have the correct format for your resume. Uh, we're also going to talk about hiring authorities and saving your searches on USA Jobs. Federal Applications 101. So we've got uh, several hiring paths in federal service. This is a major difference between federal and private sector or even local government. These hiring paths offer a way to be brought into the federal service in a non-competitive way. Uh, you will need to provide documentation depending on which hiring paths and hiring authorities you want to be considered for. Open to the public is the least restrictive path, so be sure to include um, that in all of your safe searches. Uh, we're going to go in depth into the Individuals with Disabilities Hiring Authority, and uh, we'll touch on others as well. Um, so you can uh, learn more about the uh, unique hiring paths on USA Jobs and explore those there. Uh, schedule A letter example, I'll pull that up. for you to see oh, where to go. I believe we just had it up. Okay, so let's pull up our Schedule A letter. These are tips on Schedule A. And here's a sample letter. So what I would suggest is a print out or email the sample and show it along with the criteria that's listed along on the ABCs of Schedule A. Uh, don't assume your provider will know uh, what this is, so be sure to be thorough in, in your request. Uh, you'll notice that on the side, ABCs of Schedule A, dysautonomia isn't specifically listed. As long as you're meeting the criteria of what qualifies as a Schedule A disability, you are el eligible for a Schedule A letter. Um, and you don't need to have a formal diagnosis. Uh, you will notice the things uh, like chronic fatigue are listed uh, as qualifying criteria. If you receive social security, disability, or SSCI, um, Ticket to Work programs offer a way to transition to the workplace without using your benefits. And um, you can get more information on Ticket to Work programs through your uh, state or territory vocational rehab. So I'll pause here for questions about hiring authorities. All right, if there's no questions about hiring authorities, uh, I will mention that there is also veterans recruitment appointment hiring authorities on here as well. And you can review that in, on your own time. Um, next is uh, looking at search filters for different roles and locations. You can have those notification emailed to you on a daily or weekly basis. Um, some schedule, some suggestions for keywords, our National Park Service, your current job or desired job title, college major or volunteer experience. In the location, if you're only interested in remote work, uh, you can search for that in the location. Uh, some filters include relevant pay and hiring authorities. So if you are active in your job search, I highly recommend having those emails delivered to you daily so you don't miss out on opportunities. So what I'll do here is I'm going to pull up the USA Jobs website so we can search in real time. So we're going to search here. You can see remote. Oh. And we can see show only remote jobs. So that is one option and that pulls up all remote jobs. And you can see on the right-hand side, you can see these hiring authorities listed, the pay, the grade, that would typically be for people who are already in federal service. Um, you can look at departments or agencies. 
and you can also look at the series as well. And so for this demonstration, um, I have a job that's been pre-selected, so we'll go with that one. Okay, so I search for administrative assistant, and these are all the administrative assistant roles open at the National Park Service right now. I'll pause here for questions on search features. All right, no questions. Ooh, let's stay signed in. Uh, so I have a safe job that I've, I've selected here. And we'll talk more about the qualifications in your federal resume to expand on. These uh, are to give you an idea of what you can think about as your core requirements uh, that go onto a federal resume. Learning includes your education, your certifications that you have received through um, outside agencies or inside your job, and training. That includes on the job training, outside training, um, anything you've completed. Your work experience can include work in internships, volunteerism, and military. Um, certifications, a few ideas are CPR and project management certification, your job-related training courses, any apprenticeships you've completed, licenses you hold, publications, um, honor societies uh, you've contributed to, and volunteer and leadership positions, including volunteer, civic, and other religious organizations. If you have any memberships in professional organizations and participate in any industry conferences, be sure to list those. Um, of course, there are many ways to gain experience and qualifications. Be sure you go into detail about your education, both formal, on the job, and anything else relevant. Uh, if a job requires current licenses or certifications, upload your current versions and make sure those documents are unexpired. Um, and also make sure those documents have your name on them as well. All right, um, so how, how long does this job last? Um, at National Park Service, we have jobs that last a uh, varying amount of times. Uh, we have the shortest is temporary, and these appointments may be for one year and may be extended for up to one year for a total of 24 months. A seasonal position is an annually recurring job, um, requires an employee to work full-time or less uh, than 12 months each year. A career seasonal is very similar to a seasonal. Uh, it just means you're in a non-pay status for a designated amount of time every year, and you return every year to that same position without reinstatement. Um, a term position is an appointment that's for a minimum of 13 months, and can be extended for up to four years total. Um, there are certain term appointments that can be extended for up to 10, 10 years, for instance, in the STEM field. Um, an internship can last from three months to one year, and a permanent role is year-round and continuously funded. Um, and by no means is this a limiting factor. Uh, your job funding can change, uh, and you stay in the same position, and you can have the opportunity to move to another role in federal service with parks, uh, another agency at the DO DOI, Department of Interior, uh, and there's other options to explore as well. So uh, don't, don't let one of these jobs that ends after a certain amount of time be a limiting factor in your job search. All right, so here are additional resume writing resources for you. Um, we're going to talk about the components of a federal resume. A federal resume can easily run five pages and some can be 10 pages or even longer. Um, again, uh, strongly recommended to use the resume builder. This will ensure all your information has been entered uh, in the correct format. Uh, USA Jobs and the official, official YouTube channel offer an extensive list of videos. You can also use the USA Jobs Help Center as well. Um, I wanted to make an important note here that a non-federal salary is no longer required on federal resumes. Uh, so that's what you'll see right there at the release. So there's two important links for you to review about 
those federal resumes and also that regulation as well. Um, so we're going to talk about the job announcement and job announcements are pretty lengthy, just like resumes. And you will need to be bo eligible both based on this job is open to, uh, those are the hiring paths we looked at earlier and meet the qualifications on the vacancy announcement. All right, so uh, we're going to have a demonstration after I review this slide. Make sure the duties you list on your resume are relevant and an honest reflection of your experience. They should reflect the job you're applying for. Um, if your education is relevant to the job you're applying for, certainly provide the transcripts uh, if you have the opportunity. They must be from an accredited institution. They must have your name, the school name, the credit hours, course level majors, and grade point average or ranking. Um, required documentation is a very important section of the JOA or job announcement. Uh, the rules and regulations are very stringent about the documents. Even if you have them starting your profile, you need to upload them with every vacancy you apply to. The HR specialists aren't allowed to go back and ask you questions or for additional documentation. So make sure you have that documentation um, uh, uploaded and attached to your application by the close date. Uh, if a vacancy has an applicant count, it could, could close early. And one of the things I like to do is copy and paste the duties and requirements uh, to make sure my resume matches and print it out. Um, for federal jobs on USA Jobs, all require uh, at least a resume and application with uh, questionnaires. So applying for a federal job can be very time consuming. I would say in half an hour to 45 minutes for a vacancy announcement. This isn't something you want to be while you're talking on the phone and video chatting. So set aside some time when you will have time to stretch it out and be very thorough so you won't need to rush. Um, supplemental information. Be sure you uh, read the instructions and redact any personal information such as your photo or date of birth. We're all professionals at the same time. There's probably certain information you don't want being on your application. Um, and when you apply, be sure to answer all of the questionnaires until you reach the completion screen. So what I'm going to do right now is I will pull up our sample announcement right here. And this is something I've looked at earlier and I have saved this for application. So I am going to pull this up and walk you through some of those ele elements. Oh, I went to the wrong screen. All right, let's look at the full job announcement here. Um, so this position you can see here closes after 75 applications uh, and it's still open today. So that's why I selected it for this demonstration. Uh, you can see here, this job is open to career transition and the public. So all US citizens, uh, there's two locations. You can see the salary, we do have pay transparency. You can see the pay scale and grade is a GS-5. And down below, you can look at the duties for um, incoming calls, customer service, supports the EEO and safety programs, maintaining central division files and office files, um, housing, using computers. So this is a pretty standard administrative job with some payroll responsibilities, proper management and travel. And also you will see here that there's a specific requirement for typing 40 minutes, 40 words per minute, sorry. Um, if we look down here, uh, we can see that housing is offered for this position as well. And um, you can also see that a driver's license is required and there's more qualifications here. Um, one of the ways you can qualify is by experience or education or a combination. Um, and so you can see the volunteer experience here and more information. There's information here about uh, how you will evaluate it, which gives you more indicators about the critical elements of the role. You will be evaluated based on clerical, customer service, managing and organizing information, and also managing resources. Um, 
the next thing we're going to look at is building a federal profile. Uh, so if you choose to make your resume searchable, keep all of your information up to date. If there's any changes that affect your profile, for example, if you move and you're only looking for local roles, change your location preference. When you build your profile, um, you'll need to be sure to uh, take a look at that information and make the decision for yourself if you want to make it public or private. Uh, you can save multiple resumes as well. You can save up to five. If your experience is varied or um, you've had multiple careers, that can, this can be an especially helpful tool. And so we'll switch back over here and we will take a look at profiles. I can click my name over here and I can see my profile and I can see my demographics, my hiring path and my experience as well. I can click here and see my documents. I've got four out of five resumes saved and um, I am going to tap here to build a resume. And resume name is going to be called sample for this group. And I'm going to add work experience. So I've got a resume that I have here in my file folder called sample resume that I'm going to pull up. All right, here we go. Um, so I've picked something out that's a variation of my actual resume, um, part, part truth, part fiction. Um, so right now I'm working for the National Park Service, so I'm going to copy and paste in my employer name and my employer address. We're located here on C Street in Washington, D.C. We're in the United States and the postal code is 20240. Here it is, it pulled it up for me, that's great. All right, so I started here in May of last year and I'm currently there. Salary is optional, uh, but because it's federal, I'm going to put that in. And I'm just going to put 20 per hour, and I average 40 hours per week. Hopefully, Tammy will be on the ball and pick up the phone. And we'll put that in as just Nope, it didn't go in. Okay, I put that in as all five and now duties, um, accomplishments and related skills. So I'm using a outline format as this is called where I'm going to copy and paste my skills in. Now you can see here, um, those went in just fine, so I will save this work experience. Oh, formal job title. Um, so, HR specialist, and this is exactly why we use the resume builder, because if I weren't using the resume builder, I might've left that out. And we'll put it until present, there we go. And yes, you may contact my supervisor. I'm going to save that work experience. And um, if I were actually building my resume, I would add more work experience and I'd complete all three jobs listed on my resume, as well as go through my uh, education. And I would make sure to put in my professional development and professional affiliations as well and upload that documentation. So just for the sample, I'm going to leave that out. I'm going to finish. And now I have that sample resume that I can use to apply for that job. 
I have more documents listed on my other tab as well. Um, so you can see I've got my transcripts here. I've got some other documentation for my professional certification. Um, I've got a sample typing test and um, as that's my Schedule A letter as well. Um, so I'll switch back over to our presentation. Um, now we're going to take a look at uh, the, the critical elements. So uh, when you ensure you're eligible for the hiring paths, you want to apply through USA a jobs. Um, and if you have a Schedule A disability or VRA, Veterans Recruitment, uh, you can reach out directly to the contact on uh, the job posting and apply that way. So we'll go back and take a look at that. Let's go ahead and go back to these jobs. I'll pull this recreation assistant job up just so you can get an idea for where to find them. They're all the way at the bottom almost. So this contact is named Mary Dignard. There's a phone number and an email address. So if you have a Schedule A or a VRA, make sure to reach out to that contact. All right, so uh, critical elements. Um, you will need to show that you have uh, experience demonstrated on your resume uh, based on, on the uh, qualifying criteria and make sure that you're able to show that experience or education by the closing date. Um, so whatever the closing date is, whether uh, it's listed as a week out or it has an application limit, make sure your resume is uh, going to going to match by the qualifying date. While you want to be concise, be sure you're talking about your individual achievements and accomplishments. Uh, the CCAR method is what is the challenge presented. That could be managing files, a large number of people in person, calls or data, a context. What can you tell us about the situation? Maybe your files were piled up because no one checked the mail for a year during COVID. Actions. Again, this is where it's great to be on a team, but be sure to address what you contributed and solved. And results. This is another area to address metrics in your resume, what was measurable and qualitative. Um, so in my resume, I've got some areas that I've addressed that you can take a look at here. Um, and so one of the metrics I made for this resume is uh, I created a document system for handling internal requests for recruitment support through MS forums and teams with automation and effectively manage 20 in internal requests per week. So that's an example of using the CCAR method on your resume. Um, all right, so here's assessment questions. Um, and so mostly this demonstration is to just give you an idea of what questions might be. The job description I pulled up has multiple questions. So I've decided not to use that one and instead stick to a sample. Um, the best response regarding your uh, license status. Uh, you have a valid state issues driver's license right now. You'll be able to attain one by the closing date of the job announcement or you do not have one. Um, Notice by selecting C that you acknowledge that you do not meet this requirement and will be marked ineligible. Um, and then uh, this sample position does require the operation of vehicles uh, that require the operator to possess a commercial driver's license. And again, mark how best matches your requirement. You don't possess a current class A commercial driver's license. Um, you do not currently have one or will be able to obtain one. And uh, the third option is you don't have one. Oh, I accept. Oh, okay. And assessment questions continued. Uh, this one is for electrical high voltage. So knowledge of high voltage, electrical power generating and distribution equipment, generators, transformers, switches, circuit breakers and recording instruments and control systems. 
you have little or know nothing about this, uh, have had studied or training in this, meaning you have conceptual knowledge, uh, you have used your knowledge or ability, but have been closely supervised. You've used your knowledge or ability on your own under normal supervision, uh, or you are consulted by other journey persons in difficult situations or are called on to do unusually difficult jobs. Uh, be honest with these assessments because uh, this, this will come around to the time of your interview and you will be able need to speak to it. Uh, make sure these assessment questions are also reflected on your resume because these are tied into an important factors of those job questions. Um, the next question relates to construct and install rigid conduits, pulling conductors, bus bars, phase and conduct con conductors. Again, uh, you can answer if you have little to no knowledge, uh, you have studied this, uh, you have used your knowledge uh, with supervision and uh, consult work as well. All right, so uh, the application, read all of the instructions and uh, the how to apply section. You can preview those questions as well. Um, if you're more comfortable looking those over or printing those, there is the option to preview questions. Uh, make sure that you have all your supplemental documentation ready to upload uh, as well. Uh, when you apply online, make sure you select that supplemental documentation and complete the online questionnaires until you reach the finish button. Um, if you need any reasonable accommodations, you can also send an email to the uh, job poster at the end of the page that we looked at earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my screen where I have the sample and I'm going to show you how to um, how to upload documents. So I'm going to upload documents here. And these are my sample documents in this folder. And I'm going to upload my sample driver's license. And I'm going to mark this as other and complete my upload. Um, it's asking me for an SF-50 for federal service. I'll get to that. All right, so now we have your document uploaded and uh, we can go back to the dashboard, look at our saved jobs, and we can start the application process now. So I will click apply and I will choose my sample resume that I built with the, the resume builder. And I will select my documents. I want my college and university transcripts because there is a education requirement or as we say, positive education credentialing. I will select my schedule A letter and I will select my sample typing certificate that I uploaded earlier and my samples driver's license. I will save and continue and click the acknowledge button here continue, and optional, sharing your demographic details. Um, this information is not seen by the hiring manager or the hiring team. This is only used as uh, aggregate data to show uh, what the tendencies are for uh, certain, certain groups of people to apply for jobs and who's coming into service. So I will save and continue. And how did I hear about that job? Um, an agency employee told me about it because I actually know the hiring manager of this position. I will save and continue. And I will click here and continue to submit my job. So this will load. I will click continue. And this is where we get into eligibilities. We already reviewed that on our demonstration. So this is where I'll leave off. And I won't finish applying to that job because that was just a sample. I wouldn't want to waste anyone's time on the other end. All right. Um, so let's get into the process after you apply. A certificate of the best qualified candidates is forwarded to the selecting official. Uh, you will get notifications when your information is selected for a position. That's the first phase. So if you are getting those um, 
uh, those certificate notifications, you're on the right track. Uh, your resume has a lot of good information and you're applying for jobs you're qualified to do. Um, the selecting official will then review the list of candidates and may conduct interviews, and you will be notified of both the referral status and selection or non-selection. Um, and there's the link for reasonable accommodations once again. Um, preparing to interview. And take a look at the park and the location and the park features. Uh, if you're not applying for parks, research the agency. Even if you think you're familiar with an organization, there may be a division you th haven't thought of. Uh, they may have some activities. The government is a very big place. The, gov the federal government's the largest employer in the US. So um, it's really important to take a look at everything that agency does uh, prior to your interview. Uh, you can look back at those uh, JOAs or job descriptions uh, on the vacancy posting. Those will all be saved in your profile. And uh, you can be asked technical questions such as how do you um, how do you start a new filing system from scratch um, or behavior based questions. Uh, tell me about a time when you had too much work to do um, and you had a deadline coming up soon. Uh, always bring questions to the interview. Be prepared to ask about the role and expectations. Ask your interviewer about their experience and what's it like to work at that park or region. Um, if it's not a parks role, then definitely ask what it's like to work at that agency and what it's like to work in that role. Uh, federal benefits. Uh, this, is, this is the fun part. Uh, our benefits fall into the OPM or Office of Personnel Management. We have retirement, health insurance. We have a federal employees group life insurance program, long-term care, flexible spending accounts. There's 11 federal holiday times and a curl of sick and annual leave. You can take a look at the benefits with the park service, the healthcare and insurance and federal holidays as well. Um, the parks also has specific benefits. If I can find the page on here. All right, here's my park benefits. And I was just going to talk about it. I don't have the slide up. Uh, we have child care subsidy, which is sliding based on income. We have employee resource groups. Um, we have internal training opportunities such as LinkedIn Learning and a Fundamentals 103 by visiting the Grand Canyon. Yes, park employees enjoy a free trip to the Grand Canyon. Um, the opportunity to receive sick time donations with a uh, qualifying event. If a uniform is required, uh, you are allowed a uniform allowance. Um, and if you are part of a bargaining unit, there is uh, union representation. Uh, some park have parks have very specific benefits as well, such as housing, an employee shuttle, and living at a prime destination for vacations, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, or a designated dark sky park. All right. So uh, in terms of wrap up. Uh, here's what you uh, should know and understand how to best apply for a federal career, the importance of hiring paths, and uh, how to search for a federal job and save those searches. Um, build a USAjobs.gov profile, build your resume, read those job announcements very thoroughly, and those importance in relationship to your resume, uh, catering your job to that announcement, and answering those assessment questions. So here's our wrap up critical elements, uh, read, reread the job announcement. You can copy and paste it. You can also print it, uh, rewriting your resume to every JOA you apply to. Uh, and remember to be honest when listing your education and experience, um, know and understand which hiring paths you are eligible for um, and to cover those duties and requirements that are posted in those job announcements uploading your required documents and saving those searches with your preferred email updates. So here's our final slide. That's our group email address at national recruitment team at nps.gov. Uh, these slides will be distributed to all of you for reference and we can pause here for general questions.
Okay, so it looks like we've got some really great questions. Many have been answered. And um, let's see, I think one that keeps coming up is, can you please reiterate how to show that one is a scheduled A with a disability? All right, let's, uh, let's go through the Schedule A criteria. So here we have the ABCs of Schedule A letters. Um, so um, as we talked about, the Schedule A hiring authority is for people with disabilities to streamline the process. Um, and the cr qualifying criteria is an intellectual disability, a severe a physical disability or a psychiatric disability. Um, you will need to show you need, to, you will meet the qualifications of the job with or without reasonable accommodations. All right. So um, identifying that you are a person uh, with a disability and um, uh, here's more of in information on the schedule A right here. Uh, letter three is obtaining schedule A. Uh, documentation. So it's often referred to as proof of disability documentation. And there is a link right here uh, that you can go to as well. Oh, I didn't realize that was going to pop up a new window. Okay. So, so I'm going to, no, nope, that's not what I expected to do. There we go. Open in a new tab. That's what I wanted it to do. Um, proof of disability documentation. So um, if we look at the sample here, we can go to sample schedule A letter. So this sample uh, A letter is, is for vocational rehab professionals. And this is the example from the website. Um, you'll, your professional will need to put their name, their title, uh, their, their department or agency, uh, who they're affiliated with, with their street address, their city, their state, website, phone number, um, and the date. Um, this is the body of the letter and how it's formatted. This letter serves as a certification that name, this would be your name, is an individual with a documented disability identified by the Vocational Rehabilitation Services Agency name. Uh, so for example, if I live in Utah, this would be the Utah Vocational Rehabilitation Services Agency policy and can be considered for employment under the Schedule A Hiring Authority, um, right there, for people with intellectual disabilities, severe physical disabilities, or psychiatric disabilities. You'll see here that it does not go into depth about a specific disability. So none of your information is shared, except that you are a person who meets this criteria. Um, thank you for your interest in considering this individual for employment. Uh, you may contact me at contact information and then your vocational rehabilitation professional will sign there. Um, as we stated earlier, it doesn't have to be a vocational rehabilitation professional. It can also be a, uh, a licensed medical professional, a doctor, um, or any agency that issues disability benefits as well. Okay, I think another question um, that would be very helpful for answer for you to answer would be, um, of course, it will depend on the specific job in question, but how does the federal government make accommodations for people with disabilities, specifically dysautonomia? And what are some examples of these accommodations? Uh, okay, okay. So um, one of the things we talked about uh, when you're looking at the jobs is uh, if a if a job is remote or if a job is telework, um, you can ask the job poster uh, what the telework arrangement looks like. Uh, if you need an accommodation to uh, telework more frequently, uh, if your job especially does not offer any um, in-person responsibilities, you can request a medical accommodation to work remotely. You can request accommodations to take more breaks, uh, carry around your fantastic water bottle, um, and, and the list goes on. You will initiate that through either the poster listed on the job uh, all the way at the bottom, 
or you can initiate that uh, with the hiring manager at the time of your offer. So it's really up to you when you start it, whenever you're comfortable disclosing what your um, accommodation needs are. Um, but uh, it's usually recommended to start that at the time of your offer. Uh, Tammy, Sarah, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add. Um, we're getting quite a few questions about what's the benefit of reaching out with your Schedule A hiring authority um, versus applying. And a big benefit of that is Schedule A can be hired on a non-competitive basis, meaning you don't have to have applied to the vacancy announcement. You can reach out to express interest and then the hiring official can review your application package with all other applicants that they might have received from the vacancy posting. So it's a way to kind of get your application in the door if the announcement wasn't open to Schedule A applicants or if it was open to the public. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Okay, I think another one I saw that would be really good. Um, are all federal jobs eligible for student loan forgiveness? This may be outside of their purview, but I. Um, so the way it works is uh, when you start federal service, um, you will need to contact your student loan provider and student loan forgiveness is through the student loan providers. Um, it's not a direct benefit of working for federal service, um, but it is part of federal student loans. Um, uh, private student loans are not eligible for debt forgiveness. Uh, I do know that much. Um, however, there are some hard to fill positions that do offer student loan payment. Um, I'm not aware of that ever being used at at National Park Service, but there are other agencies that do offer um, offer student loan payment. Uh, so forgiveness is handled through your um, your loan provider, and um, a student loan benefit uh, is more of a deal sweetener that would be negotiated uh, with your job. If there's any benefits uh, such as stu student loan payments, uh, it would be listed on uh, the vacancy announcement. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Uh, so can you help explain what is express interest? Ex express interest? Mm -hmm. Um, so, so by express interest, do you mean, um, reaching out to the, uh, the vacancy poster? They, they might um, need to clarify in the chat. It's a question, yeah. but I'm not quite sure what they're referencing. So they yeah. might need to provide further clarification. Okay. We can follow back up when they clarify with that. Um, okay. Here's another one that I think is pretty good. Can you provide guidance for those of us who are unable to do the typical duties of the job that we were qualified for? For example, I have years of education and experience in my STEM field, but those jobs okay. require physical demands that I could no longer do due to my disability. How do we approach asking for accommodations that would limit many job duties? Um, so you would need to reach out to uh, the vacancy poster on the job that, that's listed on the bottom. Um, you know, there are opportunities to use your STEM uh, science in other areas as well. Um, but basically, basically, for a specific job, reach out to the requester. And in general, um, there are opportunities to apply your skills in STEM uh, that don't necessarily uh, require being out in the field every day. So, for example, uh, we have environmental protection specialists, and many of those people come from a STEM background. And uh, we have uh, data professionals that, that don't necessarily work in the field every day. Um, so there's opportunities to do one of two things. You can apply your skills uh, towards 
uh, a, a different career direction while while still maintaining your your STEM background, and also uh, reaching out to those job posters to find out uh, what accommodations could be made for your situation. Okay, along the same vein, we have a very similar question. Um, this person has an MBA, but they'll likely be unable to use it. Should they even include that on their resume? They're worried they might appear to be overqualified. I okay. was about to answer that one. Sarah, do you want me to jump in? Go ahead, Tammy. Okay. So I, you know, I know in the private sector, people worry about being overqualified for positions, but this isn't the case in the federal sector. Um, it's your choice if you want to include your transcripts and put that on your resume. But as an HR professional, I would highly encourage you to, to list um, your education and also provide a copy of your transcripts. Right. I, I agree with Tammy 100%. Uh, when I started applying for federal jobs about a year and a half ago, um, I graduated in 2010 and I uploaded my transcript to every opportunity I had because I did not want to give anyone an excuse to say I was not qualified for that job. <laughs> okay, I have another question that might be a very helpful. Is there a chance they'll reject accommodations and what to do if that's the case? How do we go about getting feedback before we are rejected so we can say if it's okay if they are denied? All right. Um, Tammy, I think that's a yep. better question for you. I'll jump go ahead. In. Yeah. So um, whenever, you know, to make, I want to kind of like emphasize the process, right? So for a Schedule A applicant, you can do one of two things, and I'm going to back up a little bit what Sarah says and then kind of go forward into the question. So you can either apply directly on USA Jobs. It's up to you if you want to declare if you're a Schedule A applicant or not or you can apply directly to the job posting by contacting the agency contact in the job posting to submit your application uh, materials directly as a Schedule A applicant. Um, once you are deemed qualified for the position and you're asked to provide an interview, um, there's a whole reasonable accommodation request and a process that each federal agency uses in order to see if we can provide reasonable accommodations. So it's not just something um, that you just submit, it's an actual whole process that you go through uh, where all your documentations will be considered based upon your, your medical needs and necessities. I, I would not, uh, dis I would highly encourage anybody uh, to apply for a federal job. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, we, we highly encourage, that's why we're doing this uh, webinar, right? We want you guys to apply. We've got, we want you guys to come work for MPS, right? There's lots of love from MPS, M NPS, um, and we want you guys to apply to these jobs, and, we, and we'd love to review your resumes. Some of the chats bounce around whenever I try to answer these questions, so if you want to just go through some of these um, verbally, it's okay. There's some questions in here I don't have the stats for, like what percentage of federal employees have disabilities. I honestly don't know that stat for MPS or for federal government as a whole. So I just want to make sure I'm honest in my answers with you guys. This question might be relatively easy to answer. Can one's primary doctor uh, provide a Schedule A letter? Yeah, so Sarah, do you have, can you pull up the slide in regards to um, who qualifies for providing a scheduled A letter? That way it can be on the screen as well. All right, there you go. Right. It's right there yeah. on the screen and your doctor is the first one on there. So right. Any of these individuals can provide the documentation for the Schedule A letter. Right. Uh, it can be a general physician or a specialist. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. And then um, are there any jobs that require no previous work experience? 
So you'd honestly have to go into the job announcement to see um, the if you find like, for example, you know, you might find a GS4, a GS5 position. I honestly can't answer that without actually going into the JOA and looking at the quals and experience. The federal government does offer some positions where it's based off of education, uh, but each position is different. So it's hard for me to just throw an answer out there. My best uh, recommendation is for the applicants to go through, uh, go to USA Jobs, type in under keywords NPS, and it will come up with all our NPS vacancies and they can just go through and look to see what opportunities are out there and what interests them. Um, I also saw somebody mentioned about part-time work. Uh, the federal government does offer part-time work and also on seasonal. Um, when you type in NP NPS and you are in USA Jobs, you're going to see more filters on the right-hand side of your screen and under more filters, it allows you to click seasonal. Right now there's seven seasonal positions on USA Jobs. So sorry to jump around, but I saw it, so I wanted to throw it out there. Right. Um, so we can, we can take a look at those filters again. Um, and to add to, to what Tammy is saying, um, there are many jobs that are uh, entry level that typically fall in GS7 or below and also uh, wage grade uh, five and below would typically be uh, more, your, more your entry level jobs that don't require previous experience. Um, but if you don't have experience, this is where your volunteer experience comes into play. This is where your life experience comes in. Uh, this is where training and other qualifications come in as well. Um, you know, one of the requirements of the jobs we looked at was typing uh, a minimum of 40 words a minute. Um, you can go and take a typing test and that's a skill. And volunteer experience is fabulous, right? So some people think of right. it, um, actual employment, but volunteer experience is, is just as great as employment and make sure you list that and, and don't shortchange yourself on that. And um, I will just plug uh, Dysautonomy International. If anyone's interested in additional volunteer experience, feel free to email me directly at sleffers at dysautonomyinternational.org and we can see if we can, there's any opportunities for you to volunteer with the organization. Exactly. You've, you've got a job right now. <laughs> Would you like me just to go through and like verbally answer a couple of these questions? Uh. Sierra, that's up to you because we're at we're at six p.m. Yeah, or we can just uh, type the responses, and individuals can read them as we go. It's your choice. I just want to make sure everybody gets all the answers to their questions. Why don't um we'll give it five more minutes? Anybody who's still on who has a burning question, make sure to enter it now. And then what we can do is when we send out the the slides in the recording, I can see if we can send out the questions and the answers as well. So if you get the answer to the question, you should be able to review it at that time. It may take a little while to make sure all of the names are um, removed so that it's anonymous as much as possible, uh, but we'll try to get that done. Let's Thank see. you. Of course. Um, and then Sarah, you might be able to answer this one. Does the one page limit to resumes still apply today? Oh, uh, not for federal resumes. Um, there was a section where I talked about uh, having a resume that could run four or five pages, even longer. Um, even my sample resume that I made for this group, um, I will, I believe I shall stop sharing my screen. So let me go back. I'll resume sharing my screen. So this is this is the sample resume I made for uh, this group, which is partly true and partly fictitious. Uh, the job I'm doing at National Park Service isn't really this. Uh, I just did this for an example because uh, I wanted to be able to show and demonstrate I had the qualifications for the job. Uh, but in the past, I have had experience in uh, so this is this is real experience here with Utah's best staffing in Northrop Grumman. Um, and my education is real. This relevant professional development is real um, and uh, professional affiliations. And this this resume just with three jobs 
uh, runs three pages. So even in an entry level resume uh, can, can run that long uh, or longer. You can even go into depth about your education experience. Um, you know, if you did labs out in the field or you worked on special projects or reports, uh, if you volunteered in your school library or archives, uh, you can go into depth about that on your resume as well. So one page, two page resumes, um, don't feel like that's a limiting factor. In fact, we would encourage you to make longer resumes and be very thorough with your experience. And Sarah, can I just um, jump in and add something on that? to kind of help clarify the information sure, included ahead. in your resume. Um, when you're applying for the job and you're going through that assessment where you're answering the questions, rating your skill level of where you're at with that particular task, when your resume and your application package is submitted, it goes to a human resources specialist, an actual person that's reading through your resume, and they're looking at the work history and the documented experience, and they're supporting your responses to that assessment questionnaire based on the detail you've provided in your resume. So we typically hear one page resume, but with federal, like Sarah said, we really want a lot of information because it helps the human resources specialist to determine your qualifications and move you forward to the hiring official because we can only use the information that's been provided in your resume and other supporting documentation to move you forward in the recruitment process. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was going to type this in, but when a job says remote, no, is it still possible? Remote work might be available as a disability accommodation. Uh, yes, uh, uh, especially if a role is telework eligible, uh, a telework eligible role is more likely to be available uh, as a remote role. And again, reach out to those requesters. Um, um, a very similar question on that vein would be, is working remote or hybrid a reasonable accommodation to request when applying for a job that is listed as in-person? Um, so the, the I can question, jump in, Sarah, if you want. Go, go ahead. You can answer that, Tammy. Yeah. So um, the National Park Service has a set amount of number of positions that are available for remote option. So that... That role does not include accommodations, though. Right. If they have a reasonable accommodation, they can request that at that time. And then based upon, you know, the request that can be evaluated. But if the position is listed as remote in the job announcement, it's remote. But if a position is listed as telework, uh, it's it's telework, you know, but they will they can look at reasonable accommodation requests. There's just a lot of layers with that. It's not really a simple answer, I guess, if I should say so to speak. But it doesn't um, hurt the applicant to speak up and and ask those questions whenever they're talking to the HR specialist that's assigned to to work that job. If they reach out directly, or if they get an interview with a hiring manager to ask those questions. Um, I do want to throw out there, and this this will answer some questions in the chat, um, that some people are asking, well, what is the benefit of applying as a Schedule A applicant? And if I apply as a regular applicant, um, then I have to compete. So that means that I have to make, I have to be qualified, and then I have to make the best qualified list in order for my name to get in front of the hiring manager. If I was a scheduled A applicant, I could apply directly to, uh, with the HR office. They find If they find that I'm qualified, then my application goes directly to the hiring manager for consideration and I don't have to compete for the job. So there is a huge advantage um, of applying as a scheduled A applicant with a direct application. So sorry to throw that in there, but I saw several people asking that. So I wanted to just throw that out there. Okay, well, I actually think that's an excellent question to end the webinar on and a wonderful answer. So um, unless any of the panelists have a question that they're currently working on that they'd like to just finish 
Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for your time. This has been a very informative and helpful webinar, and I'm sure that our patients and our community members will find benefit for it for years to come. Oh, Sarah, you're muted if you're talking. Oh, yes, I said thank you for attending everyone and thank you Sierra and Dysautonomia International for hosting this event for us. Uh, the turnout's been great and questions, wonderful. Of course, it's been our pleasure and thank you everyone for attending. And as mentioned before, uh, if you've registered, you will get a, if you're here, you've registered clearly, <laughs> but you'll also get an emailed copy of the recording in about one to two weeks after we've um, uh, edited it and it's ready for broadcast. These slides that are provided should also be included and we will work on getting you the copy of the Q&A um, as organized as possible and without any names in there. So uh, feel free to answer, uh, send any further questions, but I'll be ending the webinar very shortly. So thank you again, and I hope you have a wonderful day.